so welcome back, everybody. And uh, still a lot of animated conversation happening. Um, a few things that a few things that I wanted to just say, which was um, some of you have heard me say this before. If you've been for other parts of the festival, there was some element of scepticism from various people about whether men deserved or needed a men's festival. And you know the sort of thing, as in, well, you know, haven't men got it all anyway? Isn't it, isn't, aren't men having a festival, you know, 364 days of the year anyway, etc. <laughs> and, um, you know, and also, I don't know whether you know everyday sexism. It's a wonderful sight. But, you know, there is such a thing as sexist language against men too, as in stereotypical, you know, men can't, men don't, men are useless, etc., etc. And um, you know, nothing helps any humans that's about denigration. Nothing helps any human if it's about blame and shame and no resolution. I mean, just it doesn't. Um, and one of the things that came up this morning, of course, is this mysterious and extraordinary relationship between you, your dad, your granddad, your son, etc. Not in any way leaving aside daughters and mothers, of course, but just for the purposes of this, this relationship about when that line gets broken or fractured or something. Some of the things that we haven't touched on in this festival, but in choosing to do another festival again next year, we do need to talk more about trauma. We do need to talk about subjects like male rape. We do need to talk about violence on viol violence, men on men. I mean, there's lots of things to talk about. But we have to start somewhere, and we st we've started here. Um, and w we do need as well to examine the things that are really, really tricky, which is some we touched on it slightly yesterday with being a bloke. What's the stuff of maleness? Can you define it? I and mean, I know when anybody says to me, you know, what's it like being a woman director? I always draw a bit of a blank because I don't know what it's like to be a man. So I don't really know what it's like to be a woman. I do know what it's like to be me. So in the end, there is something around identity which can finally evaporate entirely uh, you know, if you're confronted with the idea of being a man. However, it's a, it's a subject that's not likely to go away for quite a long time. And of course, as we've all found out, there isn't a third party to discuss us. You know, there's not, a, there's not a, a, another group called Not a Man and Not a Woman who can comment on us. Um, this afternoon, uh, the first session is with Akala, and some of you will have already noted how much Akala has contributed to this festival. Um, I asked Akala if he would come and do the range of things he's done for this reason. Diversity is a, an issue uh, in terms of invitation and acceptance of invitation in big gatherings. Yesterday, we had 800 people because we decided to make it a, a big day. Um, and gradually, as the word around being a man got out, we had more and more diverse audiences, and that was fantastic. It is a much less diverse audience today, and actually, interestingly, that's because it sold out 10 days ago. I'm not, I'm not putting those two things together, but th 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 there's a longer thing I could explain about that. But really what I'm saying is it's a question of trust. By yesterday, we had the trust of an awful lot of people, and it became a much more diverse experience. I think that when w women's meetings were beginning, the ones that I went to, Sometimes you lived in fear of saying the wrong thing. You know, it's, it's useful to, be, to have the etiquette of language and be respectful, but it also can be difficult if you feel like you can't ask and you can't say and you might get it wrong, etc. And um, one of the things that Akala is so uh, jovial and confrontational about at the same time is the fact that there's just a total lack of education between us all about black history, role models, issues to do with real history that is our shared world history, etc. And also things that lead us to uh, to assume things about other tribes, if you like, uh, whether that's the tribe of older fierce women or, you know, the, the tribe of younger Essex men, whatever it is, we, you know, people fall into stereotypes quite quickly. So I think very uh, boldly and generously, Akala is going to take this next session which is a, a talk for 15 minutes and then 15 minutes questions. Uh, he's a hip-hop artist, he's a historian, and he's the artistic director of the Hip Hop Shakespeare Company, which he founded, which, which does workshops, live theatres and productions all over the world. Uh, he won the MOBO Best Hip Hop Award in 2006 for his debut album, It's Not a Rumour. He's released three more albums since then. 
Um, he also works for the BBC, London Metropolitan Archives, Film Festival, and he uses hip hop to engage young people, not just young people, with subjects such as African culture and history, human rights, racism, etc., and the history of hip hop, which is m long and much more varied than we might think. So, can welcome to the stage, please, Akala. I need to give a bit more notice there, didn't I? I should have said, come on up, Akala. <laughs> and your phone rings when you're about to tell everyone else in the audience, please do remember to put your phone on silent. Um, and so thanks for the introduction. I'm as embarrassed as I usually feel when those kind of introductions are made, but it's all good. Um, so today we're going to talk about following on from what Jude was saying and following on from some of the things we've dealt with the weekend with what's usually a, quite a taboo subject, or at least in my view is a taboo subject. When we deal with histories of race, racism, colonialism, <coughs> neo-colonialism, white supremacy, classism, capitalism, all of these isms in the world, we usually tend to, if we dialogue about them at all, think of them in plain economic terms often, you know, or in plain political terms. What we rarely look at is psychological motivations, let alone psychosexual motivations or, or how these uh, mind states, how things other than logical material motive motivate behaviors towards different groups of people, if that makes sense, right? There is uh, a logic to certain kinds of oppression in that there are very real gains from those kinds of things, but there is no logic, at least to my mind, to things like serial killing or to, I don't know, hacking someone up and frying them in a fridge, right? There are certain strange human behaviors that exist as extreme as that or as mundane as the day-to-day, -day. and one of them I want to look at today is the intersection of sex and race, particularly between men, particularly between black and white men. And this relationship or this obsession in some ways, this historical obsession around black masculinity and black virility and black male sexual power. So I'm going to play a video that was, just not, not just yet, but a video that was screened just before the 200 meters final on the BBC. Um, and it was a basically a eugenics video, as you're going to see, essentially suggesting the reason why a few tiny percentage of the black men on the earth can run very fast is because they were bred to run fast during slavery, which is very interesting. I'm going to break down why it's complete pseudoscientific nonsense, but then I'm going to look at what it means about the culture and what it says further than that. Unfortunately, the only version of it I could find, the sound cuts off after one minute, but I'm going to leave the video playing as I talk because you'll see the imagery runs directly into a sort of 18th century eugenics, Nazi, very weird... Um, and in fact, the only, the only uh, place it's up on the web is as the weird BBC eugenics film. Uh, but <laughs> it, it runs into very weird, strange territory, and it, it really didn't get much comment in the media, it didn't get much comeback. In fact, kind of disgracefully, in my opinion, uh, Michael Johnson, who's obviously very ignorant of his own history, was then hired by Channel 4 to do another whole hour-long documentary looking at this supposed relationship between slavery and, like I said, 80. So 80 black men of the, one, of the 600 million black men on earth have run the 100 meters in under 10 seconds, 80. So it's not exactly representative of all of our athletic, uh, athletic abilities, but apparently there's some relationship, and even Michael Johnson subscribes to that silly idea. So if I can play the video, and then we'll talk a little further. And this is a subject that doesn't get raised very often because it just doesn't. But the fact is that not a single white athlete has contested the men's 100 meter final in the Olympics for 32 years. 82 people have broken 10 seconds for 100 meters and 81 of them have been black. The only one that is white is Christophe Lemaitre of France who is running tonight in the 200 meter final. In fact, only four white men have undergone under 20 seconds for 200 meters. So it brings the whole issue of nature or nurture into very sharp focus. In November 1859, On the Origin of Species by Charles Darwin was published. As you can see, the, the sound cuts out there quite unfortunately, but it does get even more ridiculous, and it goes into, like I said, this whole kind of 18th century eugenics uh, stuff. So I'm going to do a few things. I'm going to look at the semantics of what the gentleman said, but first of all, I'm going to, just in case there's anyone in here, which would be understandable, that subscribes to this myth of the breeding of the super slave, which even many people in the island, my grandmother comes from in Jamaica, actually believe in this crap, that in Jamaica the most rebellious Africans were dropped off and were bred in a particular way. Let's explain something very basic. Ten times the amount of Africans were taken to Brazil as were taken to the United States of America. In fact, historians estimate as many Africans were taken to Brazil as the rest of the Americas combined. 
Today, there are 85 million people that self-identify as black in Brazil. And if you know anything about Brazilian society, you know that that means there's a whole lot more people that you would think of as black that do not identify as so. So it means there are at least 40 times as many black people in Brazil as there is in Jamaica. Slavery went on more than half a century longer in Brazil than it did in Jamaica, yet Brazil produces no sprinters. It doesn't take a genius to figure out why. Sprinting is not culturally rewarded in Brazil. It's not popular. Nobody does it. Football, the sport that is, as you know, Brazilians are quite good at. In Jamaica, the youth, so if you're a school child, the school athletics meet fills the national stadium. So it's not difficult, again, to figure out why that is rewarded. And then in terms of the insulting idea that centuries of malnourishment and mistreatment can improve a person's genetics, of course, to anyone with a GCSE level knowledge of biology becomes completely ridiculous. But even to be specific, if you've grown up in an African Caribbean community, even in this country, everyone who lives in Brixton or Peckham or Tottenham or anywhere else knows, visibly, the biggest, strongest kid in the class was always the Ghanaian or the Nigerian kid. It was never the Jamaican kid. So there's very real evidence, even if you were to look at it. If you go to around, when I first traveled to West Africa, you can visibly see the greater physical stature of men in West Africa than, say, in the Caribbean. And that would logically follow like I said, that the, the centuries of malnourishment and mistreatment in that way would actually retard rather than improve your genetics. The fact that despite that, people in the Caribbean and other places are still strong is a testament to their humanity, not a testament to the great uh, sideways gift of benevolent slave masters. But, um, that, but that's what's being suggested. And, that, and, and, and the fact that it was put on before the 200 meter final. I want you to think about the significance of, of what that is being said by the... Think about how many people had to make a decision for this film to go on television. How many old men in offices said, yeah, this is a good idea? Right between the 200 meters, before the 200 meters final, we need to ensure that the white world understands that if black people ever beat us in anything, there must be an explanation. It can't just be because they were more disciplined and they trained harder. The reason why I point that out, right? The reason why I point that out is because notice what he said. He didn't say 40% of the human males on earth are either Chinese or Indian. Right? There's 1.1 billion people in India, about 1.5 billion people in China. Right? He didn't say no Chinese or Indian men have ever won. Do you see? He made it very clear, made a very clear white nationalist statement that the issue was that white men weren't winning. It wasn't that Chinese men are not winning. It wasn't that Indian men are not winning. He didn't point out that the Japanese relay team came fourth, right? which means there are four Japanese men that are faster than all but 12 of the black men on the planet. <laughs> right? None of that came up because it, it was about something else. It was about whoever commissioned this film, as you can see the images of slavery and everything else coming up now. Um, it was about whoever commissioned this film and their personal uh, psychosexual obsession with black masculinity and with explaining away their own insecurities. And even worse than that, saying that any insecurity they feel or any, any uh, inadequacy they feel in relation to people that look like Linford Christie, as if most black men do even look like Linford Christie, any uh, discomfort they feel with that can be explained away uh, by this ridiculous history of oppression. We're not looking for why Scandinavian people always dominate the world's strongest man. We would never make such a ridiculous and insane ahistorical argument that, I don't know, Europeans dominate tennis because their ancestors had such a long history of whipping people. It would be stupid. <laughs> but that's the equivalence of, 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 of this kind of ridiculous argument, right? But it has, it has social precedent. When Linford Christie won Olympic gold in 1992, I remember this being 10 years old, and I remember how it affected me, right? Because I knew even at 10 it was insane. This man, presumably, must have had the same penis for his entire career, right? He didn't suddenly develop a new penis the day he won an Olympic gold medal. Yet, at no other point in his career was what was in Linford's trousers an issue. The moment he wins the Olympic gold medal, the next day, just to remind Linford Christie, in case he fought for a moment, that winning a gold medal on behalf of this country and wrapping himself in the Union Jack made him a citizen of the country, he was reminded by the entire national media that all he was was a big, long, walking black penis. Right? And I remember seeing there was, a, there, was a, uh, there was a hosepipe ban the same year, in the same time. No, this is real, because and I was 10, right? Think about remembering this. And I remember a little cartoon, in a, it was The Sun or one of these papers, I'm not going to name exactly which one, I was 10, I can't remember, right? And I opened it, and it had Linford Christie walking up to the hosepipe ban man, and the hosepipe ban man pointing at his trousers telling him there was a hosepipe ban, right? That's how ridiculous it got. Linford went on a question of sport. Does anyone remember that? Yeah. With Jimmy Greaves, and he started crying. And this really, to me, when we talk about masculinity, it was profound that 
kind of a, a flabby, not very strong, not necessarily stereotypically virile man like Jimmy Greaves could reduce Linford Christie to tears. But w by projecting his own insecurities onto Linford Christie, for, for those who didn't see it, they were having a conversation. Linford, quite rightly, was a little bit pissed off about the fact that he just won an Olympic gold medal and all anyone could talk about was what was in his, in his trousers. And Jimmy Greaves thought it was a big joke. And Linford started crying. And I think that the, 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 that was actually quite beautiful. The reason why I say that is because particularly as African Caribbean men, we, this is what I've been saying to people all weekend, we tend to think of racism as this thing out there that white people do that everyone else is passive victims of, which may be flattering to, to racist people's egos, but just isn't reality. There are plenty of black and brown people who internalize the idea that white people are superior in various different ways. There are some even who love that idea because it gives them power, right? If I can be attached to power, whatever color that power is, throughout the history of it, all kinds of imperialism, people will do that. So lots of people find it difficult to express themselves within that and even internalize and then project, rap music being one of the main ways in which black men project this kind of fake, super hyper-masculinity, right? That we know is not real. Black men in America don't control the country. They don't make the guns. They don't have the biggest weapons in America. They're not the most violent part of American society. They may commit a lot of murders within America. They're not colonizing the rest of the world. But what rap does and what other projections of, of the image of black men within Western culture does, it, it kind of creates a deal, in my view, where men from impoverished African-American neighborhoods, right, that know they don't really run the country, that don't really have the power, can project themselves as the biggest, baddest guy in the country. And the people who actually make the guns that they're killing each other with, right, who created the neighborhood that they live in, that's not to excuse per people's personal responsibility, can say, look, here's the gangsters. We can have... Every year, hundreds and hundreds of Hollywood films with Bruce Willis, or Arnold Schwarzenegger, Sylvester Stallone, or whoever else, with their gun on it, at no point does anyone say, what is wrong with white men and their obsession with guns? All right? But one rapper, which is really the only one I know of in modern history, poses with a gun on the cover of his rap CD, and apparently all black men have an obsession with guns, which is very interesting. And so it's, it's for me, even around rap music, the dialogue around what it says, A, about how black men feel about one another, that we think is entertaining to listen to music, telling, that sounds like it could easily have been made by the Ku Klux Klan, right, some of this music, if you think about what's being said. But it also says a lot about the wider culture, that you can sell 10, 11, 12, 15 million records to young middle class white kids in suburbia saying die nigga die, shoot nigga shoot, kill nigga kill, right? And as I always say to people, say to young black boys when I work with them and they write these lyrics, I, I'm not going to cuss you, I used to write that kind of nonsense, right? I grew up listening to Mob Deep and thought it was quite cool, right? But I said to them, okay, let's, let's look at it like this, my mum's white, my dad's black, right? If I start writing lyrics saying, let's kill whitey, let's go kill some honkies, what do you think the reaction would be? And without exception, every single young black boy I've said this to, even the ones that write these kind of lyrics, I'm going to kill some niggas when I see them, every single one says, no, you can't do that, that's racist. Every single one without exception, I've done it in prison, I've done it in schools, I've done it in loads of... So what does it say about what they believe about the value of white life versus their own life? And I would say the, the interaction between sex and violence, and sex as violence, men... Uh, tend to imagine, in many ways, sex as violence. This is our gun, our tool. The fact that it's the most sensitive organ that any human has, male or female, seems to escape men, or maybe it's because it's such a sensitive organ that we pretend it has so much power. A woman's sexual organ is muscle, a man's sexual organ is not. Who really has the sexual power? I think all men that have ever had sex with women know who really has the power. But anyway, I don't want to embarrass anyone, including myself, right? <laughs> but, but I think it's this, this, uh, this, this area that is very liberating to discuss that takes a certain amount of comfort that we never do. And I think to reflect and in, in, in closing, that sort of image for me of seeing Linford Christie cry in that way, on the one hand felt very embarrassing, made me very angry, it was very oppressive, but it was also very beautiful that a man that could clearly snap Jimmy Greaves' neck in a split second if he wanted to, was comfortable enough in, him, in his own self to say, I'm so disgusted, not complimented, because this is a, the, the issue, right? Hyper-masculinity and this idea of being sexual predators and dominant and whatever is also kind of attractive. So for a lot of young African Caribbean men, even if they don't feel that way, even if they're not particularly physically strong, even if they don't have the capacity to do violence, because that is seen as attractive, that is seen as the way to be, or as, as my friend Jaja So said when he was 15, he believed he wasn't a real black boy if he didn't go to prison. That was his self-concept, and he did, as a self-fulfilling prophecy, go to prison. Now, if he lived in Nigeria or Ghana or anywhere else, he wouldn't have believe that was part of his identity. That doesn't mean there are not criminals in those places. It means that when I go to Ghana and Nigeria, I see black men walking down the street holding hands, and it's weird to me, because I, we're not capable of showing that kind of love in this kind of 
society. So I think that having more platforms for open discussion about the more perverse aspects of things like racism is, is, discom is discomf discomforting for a lot of people, is difficult. But I think there are deeper insecurities and issues and motivations behind a lot of these behaviours that we don't like to talk about, but if we're ever going to unpick and defeat, and I think this applies to sexism as well, to reflect on that last point I was saying, I think the very real and obvious greater sexual power that women actually do have in relation to men, I believe in, in, in the, and I've learned from the Taoist actually Chinese tradition, that part of men's frustration is this obvious difference in power. And we try to compensate for that in various different ways. In the Chinese Taoist tradition, what they actually teach men to do is to do something, I was talking to Judy about this the other day, is to ejaculate. So they actually teach men a system by where men learn to orgasm without ejaculating any fluid. It sounds strange, but I know people that practice it, so I know that it does actually happen. And it does a number of things. It means, means men don't constantly expel life force from their body. And he's, he argues that because it evens, in some way, the, the, the relative uh, power imbalance between men and women in the bedroom, that he thinks that would go some way to curing something. Now, I'm not saying he's right or wrong. What I'm saying is, in part, other parts of the world, there are conversations being had around sex, around these kinds of taboos that I think we could learn from, that we don't have ever in public, I don't think, a mature discussion about what is even good sex or bad sex, right? There's pornography everywhere in the world. You can see sex more than you can ever see it before, but we can't talk even in sex education in school. Imagine young boys are never taught, don't do that. That porno you watch, not good. You know, no one ever, ever talks to people maturely, which, like I said, there are other systems in other places that do, about what makes good and bad sex. And if we did more, I think that a lot of these insecurities would be removed, a lot of the mythologies would be removed that imprison the people that create the mythologies and the people that are on the receiving end of those mythologies. So I think it's just important for us to have these discussions on a bigger, broader level uh, without fear of offending anyone, because if we believe in democracy, then that's what democracy is about, is having even the most uncomfortable discussions. Thank you very much. We will open for questions. I think I stuck for 15 minutes. But we'll see. Just give me the five-minute wave, Jude, when it, when it, when it goes. Does uh, anyone have any questions, comments? It doesn't have to be a question to the experts. I don't believe in that. Um, don't be shy. And don't all jump at once. Let's go. We'll take three at once because it always makes it quicker. One, two, three. You can start here if you want. Yeah, that's it. That's it. If the mic's there. And then. Oh, thank you. Um, oh, God. It's a bit loud. Um, it was beautiful. Thank you. I really enjoyed that talk. It was wonderful. Um, I'd just be interested to hear your thoughts. It was very interesting to hear about your um, sort of take on things about people identifying or young boys identifying they need to sort of go to prison. Mm -hmm. um, I know from my experience, I've also found like almost the reverse about uh, my relationship with sexuality causing profound sort of disempowerment mm -hmm. um, and almost a sense that um, that disease with sexuality, mm -hmm. um, really meaning that a lot of men grew up unable to use the, 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 the positive powers that being a man gives you mm -hmm. uh, for good. Mm -hmm. I'd just like to get your thoughts on that, really. Um, I feel there's so much more men can do in the world, and when I look around at um, all the power a lot of men have, mm. I think it would be nice to uh, yeah, see more examples of using that, that kind of raw energy, that raw power, that sexuality, which would be sex is a sacred thing, a, a, a sexual, uh, sacred sexual practice for good. Just be interested to hear your uh, thoughts on that. Yeah, thank you. We'll take, I'll take three at once, and then we'll yeah, please, yeah. Is this on? You hear me? You sure? Yeah. Um, th this is a difficult one. I always have this fear when, if I'm in that position and someone asks a question, it's not really a question, it's a statement. So I don't want to kind of do a disingenuous thing yeah. like that. But I just wanted to say that um, when you were speaking, it felt so alive mm. and I felt so connected and there were moments in there. And the thing about Linford Christie mm. being able to weep in yeah. front of this kind of plastic old Jimmy Greaves and yeah. that, but just the kind of, the openness of that. Mm. And I struggle because I'm 62 years of age I was steeped in all the kind of misogyny and racism because I was porous. You know, when I'm younger, you know, you're porous and all that. And sometimes, I've been here for the last two days, and sometimes when it becomes about what's to be done about them, 
whether it's women or, or feminism, or, and even the kind of Latinate terms used, patriarchy, mm -hmm. it kind of, I feel disempowered. And I feel like it, it always has to come back to what you've done, which is stand up there and say, this is who I am. Mm. In a, you know, a, 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 and bring, yes, the rational bit, and, and this, this, here's the history, mm. and here's how selective this history is. Mm. But I just, um, that's, that's my hope for conversation. I think the conversation is the solution. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think we need to design some big framework or something. I think that's bollocks. That's mm -hmm. sort of, that, that's the, a, re a, re a rehearsal of the same cycle. But I just, um, I think what you said when you, talk, you used the word mature a couple of times, mm -hmm. and it's having a safe place where we can speak and we can show up and, and show up with all our prejudices and all our things and get mm -hmm. them out in the light because then they can move, then they can change. Yeah. And I think um, that's, so that, that's all I'm sort of wanted to say to you. Mm -hmm. You gave me permission to say this. That's it. Thank you, that's a beautiful thing. Thank you. And the last one, I'll do that three in the morning. If we've got time, we'll take a few more. <coughs> Hi, uh, um, I was just wondering if uh, you talked about the hyper-masculinity, mm. um, which is sometimes portrayed by mm. um, Afro-Caribbean men. Mm. And I was kind of wondering if a part of that is about the fact that it's this uh, section of the community which has been kind of emasculated mm. in a lot of ways. And so there's, can be an overcompensation Sometimes it's the only way you can um, express your masculinity, whether that's through sexual prowess or something like that, or the hyper-masculinity you were talking about. And, I mean, there is some context. I work with young, homeless, LGBT people, and um, I'd say probably about 80% of the young people we work with are from Afro-Caribbean backgrounds, mostly, mostly men. It seems like it's the ultimate insult to be a black man and to be gay. You know, and so they're sort of thrown out of their homes. They're completely alienated from their um, communities. Mm -hmm. So I wondered if you had any sort of thoughts or comments around that. Yep, cool. So we'll start here. Um, in terms of men using their power, um, I don't know. I, I think maybe men need to relinquish power. I think maybe that's, that's a, uh, part of the, the problem. I think that I don't romanticise. Like I gave a talk about history and the history of gender conceptions the other day, not to romanticise, but it's to really... We tend to feel very good about ourselves because we finally come to the conclusion in the 21st century that it might be a good idea to maybe consider treating half of the human species a bit better. And we get very proud and arrogant about that to the point that we think we can invade other people's countries to tell them to do the same. But this isn't a new idea, right? For thousands of years, there's been societies that have conceived as men and women differently than to we understand. And again, it's about learning and going backwards. So in many cultures, traditions, gender is a continuum. What I spoke about the other day was like a group, there's a a group uh, in Africa called the Dogon, who are a tribe who have a tremendous amount of astronomical knowledge. There's been a lot of studies done around them. They conceive as gender as being a continuum and that a human, male, can be born with a female spirit. A human, biologically female, can be born with a male spirit. Or you can be born with a twin spirit. A twin spirit is what we would call a homosexual person, right? And they believe that twin spirits are the gatekeepers to the other world, to the sacred. All the priests in the Dogon tradition, I found that recently, are gay that you find similar in Native American traditions. Now, does that mean these places are perfect utopias where nothing goes wrong? Of course not. What I'm saying is we have to revise what it even means to be a man because part of men's quest for power is because we're told that's, that's what it means. If you're a man without power, without the ability to do violence, right? Because really in this world, that's what power comes down to. Who's on the UN Security Council? The nations that have the capability to do the most violence, right? And so it's trying to trying to be vulnerable, really, and be okay with being vulnerable, but be okay with sharing power with women. Being okay with sharing power with men that look a little different, but it's difficult because vulnerability in this world can mean being killed, li literally being killed, being powerless. Powerlessness is ugly. So it's, it's, it's also not about being romantic and flowery. It's, it's a very real challenge. How do we feel assured and confident of our place in the world in such a violent, uh, disparate world with such a long history of economic and social and racial and political warfare, and at the same time trying to be comfortable in our spiritual selves. There's a certain amount of privilege paid for in bloodshed for us to even sit in this room and have this lovely, flowery, liberal discussion. So I don't actually have the answer, but I do know if men particularly don't sort our shit out, there's every chance that we might destroy the earth forever. It's not an unbelievable, inconceivable scenario. It's not about doomsday. We have created enough weapons to literally wipe out the human species forever, which is crazy. Thank you for your point, that, that was a point. So on to what you're saying, I think it's absolutely that. Even in my own experience, right? When I was 19, 18, 15, and I felt undermined, despite the fact I was a straight A student, I was constantly getting harassed by the police, the things that I was going through, the way I was spoken to by teachers, the competition in the street, which was specifically, let's be clear, when you're a 15 year old black boy in this country, 
the people you want to fight are other black boys. You'll see a group of white boys and not even notice them, a group of Asian boys. You don't even see them. They might as well not even exist. So what is it about this? Inter we talk about it. We say black men are overrepresented in the criminal justice system. Black boys kill each other more than anyone else. We never say, but what does that say about Britain? That's not excuse. That's not an excuse for the community to solve the problem. I know who has to solve the problem. It's not an excuse to uh, take away personal culpability either. It's about saying, what does that say that I can grow up in this country and end up hating people that look exactly like me? And the people who project this hyper-masculinity are exactly the ones that feel the most vulnerable. The reason why I can stand here today and talk to you like this is because 10, 15 years later, having traveled the whole world, feeling relatively accomplished in my career, not feeling anywhere near that same sort of sense of vulnerability, I don't feel uncomfortable in that. But 10 years ago, I, wouldn't, I couldn't talk to you about any of these things 10 years ago. And so I think the shunning of homosexuality, particularly in Jamaican culture, is underpinned by two things, this vulnerable masculinity, but also Christianity. So we always talk about Jamaica being so homophobic, and we never say, well, what's their justification? What's the reason? Their justification, let's be clear, Shabarank said, God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, right? Now, of course, that's what he said, right? Of course, Jam the Bible also says adultery is a crime. I'm, I'm sure Jamaican men are not adhering to that either. So I'm not disputing the hypocrisy in it, but it, um, it again, isn't dialogued in its fullness. We have to wrap there, but thank you very much.